I'd like to share an experience my friend and I have unfortunately been dragged into. At approximately 10.30 p.m. tonight, I received an instant message from my friend about a rather disturbing encounter she had. She had reported she saw the Mothman. I sent her several messages back asking if she was all right, if she was there, etc. She eventually sent me a text message with a picture that she drew of the creature attached. By this point, I was literally getting sick and trembling due to anxiety and fright. We began talking about it, and I noticed a tapping. At my window, a very light kind of sound. My dogs both jerked their heads upward and stared at the window for a long time. Being in the state I was in, I refused to look. For a while, the tapping stopped. She and I continued to discuss the matter at hand. Suddenly, the tapping began again. But this time, the dogs ignored it, and so did I. About four or five minutes later, I fought the urge to stare at my computer monitor and looked at my window. My blinds were closed, but I could faintly see something red and glowing, like taillights that had somehow made their way into the neighbor's backyard. I quickly looked away, not wanting to see it anymore. I looked again a couple minutes later, unnerved to see the red glow was still there. Again, I looked away and continued discussing this with my friend. Finally... I turned my head one final time and saw that the glow no longer remained. As I'm typing this email, I'm really worried as the tapping has begun again, and I'm really too afraid to move from this position. Above this, I've included my friend's side of the story, and should you post this, we would certainly appreciate if you could put them both into one piece. We discussed calling the police, but she didn't want to make a big deal about it. Her parents brushed it off, and I have yet to tell anyone in my house about this. I'm not sure what this was, a frightening delusion or a real situation, but I'm not sure if I'm willing to face the facts and find out. I used to be a park ranger at Yellowstone National Park, and I loved my job. The breathtaking landscapes, the majestic wildlife, and the sense of solitude made every day an adventure. But that all changed one fateful evening, and now I can't erase the haunting memory from my mind. It was a typical day on patrol when I received a call about a possible injured animal near one of the remote trails. Concerned for the safety of both the visitors and the wildlife, I decided to investigate the matter personally. As I approached the trail, I noticed an unusual silence in the air. Normally, the forest would be alive with the sounds of birds and rustling leaves, but now there was an eerie stillness that sent a chill down my spine. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was not right. I followed the trail cautiously, my flashlight guiding the way through the encroaching darkness. Suddenly, my senses were jolted as I caught sight of a strange figure up ahead. It was enormous, standing at least eight feet tall, and its dark gray fur blended with patches of brown. At first I thought it might be a bear, but its features were unlike anything I had seen before. It had a mane, similar to that of a male lion, but the rest of its body and legs had shorter hair. Most astonishingly, it was walking upright on its hind legs, resembling a grotesque hybrid of human and animal. My heart raced in my chest as I struggled to comprehend what I was witnessing. This couldn't be real. There were no known animals like this in Yellowstone, or anywhere else for that matter. The creature seemed to sense my presence and turned its head in my direction, locking its eyes with mine. Fear and curiosity battled within me as I hesitated, unsure of how to react. Then, without warning, the creature dropped to all fours and disappeared into the shadows, moving with an agility and speed that defied belief. I stood there, paralyzed by shock, trying to process what I had just seen. My mind raced with possibilities, but none of them made any sense. The encounter was overworldly, and I, I knew I had stumbled upon something beyond my understanding. I rushed back to the ranger station and tried to compose myself, but the image of the unknown predator lingered in my mind. I couldn't keep this to myself. I had to tell someone. So I shared my encounter with my fellow rangers, hoping they would have an explanation but all I received were incredulous stares and nervous laughter. Feeling dismissed and disillusioned, I eventually decided to leave my job as a park ranger. 
The encounter had shaken me to my core, and I couldn't bear the thought of returning to those woods, not knowing what else might be lurking in the shadows. My friends and I were around 13, 14 years old. An old abandoned house was on a dirt road about two, three kilometers from where we grew up. We checked out the house and realized it was packed with marijuana plants and what looked like a sophisticated operation. We ran away, but two of my friends went back, wanting to steal the marijuana. I knew this was occurring, but choose to stay home. When they were inside, the owner or our operator came into the house with a rifle. My friends hid in the closet. He passed directly by the closet with a rifle. He spent about ten minutes looking around the house, and then he left. They then departed the house and ran home through the woods. They did think they might have been shot that day, and they never did see his face. For me, personally, if you're out in the woods or in an abandoned facility and you see a drug operation, I found myself lounging near the tranquil shores of Faleron, a place known for its romantic allure. Lost in contemplation, I stood upon the rugged rocks, my gaze fixated on the vast expanse of the sea. It was in this moment that a peculiar sight caught my attention. Glancing to my right, I spotted two young men perched upon the rocks not far from where I stood. They possessed an imposing stature, towering above the average man. Curiosity peaked. I directed my gaze towards them, only to discover that they were observing the stars through a large square object of extraordinary brightness. Its radiance was nearly blinding, and as I observed it with astonishment, a breathtaking spectacle unfolded before my eyes. Mars, the red planet, materialized before me in vivid detail, as if a grand performance were unfolding on a theater stage. The two strangers engaged in intricate finger movements and seemed to communicate with the inhabitants of Mars. Astonishingly, the people of this distant world responded in a language unfamiliar to my ears. I beheld women and girls of ethereal beauty, tall and graceful, their captivating forms etching themselves into the depths of my memory. Birds of vibrant plumage flitted about, alighting upon the shoulders of these celestial maidens. I bore witness to a multitude of mesmerizing sights and heard melodies of unparalleled loveliness. After some time, the two strangers averted their gaze from the planet, and in the blink of an eye, Mars resumed its place in the firmament, just as it had always been. Overwhelmed by the encounter, I approached the enigmatic duo. As they caught sight of me, they shifted their positions and politely asked if I could spare a light. I offered them matches and cigars, which they graciously accepted. In return, they bestowed upon me a single cigar, claiming to have acquired it in Cuba the day before. To my bewilderment, I informed them that Cuba lay over 4,000 miles away. Undeterred, the two men calmly stated that they hailed from the planet Mars. Intrigued, I listened intently as they proceeded to unveil an extraordinary narrative of civilizations thriving on the distant planet. They spoke of ancient conflicts between various Martian factions, describing their adversaries as the Pelagians. Eventually, the Pelasgians were vanquished and the survivors fled in airships, eventually landing in the northwestern region of Greece, which we now know as Albania. These refugees, it seemed, were the original settlers of Greece. Furthermore, the Martians revealed that Earth civilization in the year 1905 lagged behind Mars by a staggering 100,000 years. They claimed that war had not plagued Mars for over 200,000 years, and astonishingly, they had unraveled the secret of immortality. According to these extraordinary beings, electricity held the key to eternal life. Each morning, the Martians would supposedly nourish themselves with electricity as a potent antidote against death. To my astonishment, they even proclaimed that the revered philosophers Socrates and Demosthenes were not mere figures of history, but currently lived on Mars, flourishing in their immortal existence. Soon, the shrill sound of a whistle pierced the air, emanating from one of the Martians who introduced himself as Telemachus while his companion went by the name Phidias. In response to the signal, two robust men emerged from a nearby boat, 
leaping fearlessly into the waters that plunged to depths of no less than sixty feet. Strapped to their feet were elongated skates fashioned from glistening yellow metal, affixed with sturdy wires. This remarkable contraption enabled the Martians to glide safely across the water's surface. Captivated by this mesmerizing display, I found myself ushered aboard a magnificent floating airship. Within its opulent confines we dined together, and it was there that I learned of their primary objective on Earth. To meet the renowned inventor Edison in relation to a recent invention that could potentially prove fatal for humanity. Eventually the time came for me to bid farewell to my extraordinary Martian companions. They escorted me back to the shore, where we parted ways, our encounter etched deeply into the fabric of my memory. It was about 8 p.m. and I was driving home after dropping a friend off at her house. I came to an intersection, a red light, and stopped. Nothing out of the normal, just a regular night. The roads were fairly deserted. While waiting for the light to change, I saw something that looked like the back end of a deer as it quickly crossed the street. I didn't think much of it except for the fact that when I drive through there, I have to be careful because deer apparently like to jump in front of cars. That stretch of road is only a couple hundred feet posted at 40 miles per hour. I slowed to about 30, 35 miles per hour to watch and look at the deer. When I looked to see if the deer was still there, I witnessed something quite a bit different. This massive thing was standing back ways, but it was clearly visible. The yard it was standing in has a huge white shed with a light attached to the front, though. This didn't help because it cast a big shadow. The figure stood on the ground, but its height reached to about the top of the doors to the shed. It had two curved-like masses coming from the sides. But the most obvious feature were the deep red glowing eyes coming from the center of the black mass. It was something I couldn't stop looking at. I continued to drive, but all the way home, I felt I was being followed. This is kind of a long story, but the creepiest thing happened to me, and I really need to tell this story while the details are still fresh in my mind. Although I'm pretty certain I'll never forget it for some reason. I feel like this is important and I need to share. Last night, May 31, June 1, 2020, I went to Chesapeake, Ohio, to a friend's house to play music and sing. We jammed until around 3 a.m. When we left, we headed towards Proctorville, Ohio, to take the bridge into Huntington, West Virginia. That stretch of road runs alongside the Ohio River. It is dark, and there aren't many street lights, so it was dark, and last night, it was cold. We were talking and trying to get the heat going when all of a sudden a tall black figure appeared seemingly out of nowhere on the side of the road, literally right beside my door, passenger side. We were going around 50-60 miles per hour and this thing didn't budge. I felt it though. No other way to explain it except that it was so close to my door that I felt it, and what I felt was wrong. It was sinister and did not come from a place of good. It looked like it was about seven, eight feet tall. We were in a pickup truck. A Dodge Ram, I believe. It was so tall that my friend who was driving said maybe it was a road work, road work, a black tarp draped over it. It was taller than the truck. It looked shrouded, almost like it had wings, but they were wrapped around its body. It appeared out of nowhere, and it seemed like it leaned toward the truck as we passed by it. So close that I felt it, like in my soul and in my skin, so close that if my window had been down I could have touched it. It made me actually shiver as we drove by it. I am an empath, and I'm telling you this thing sent me everything it had, and it had nothing but darkness to send. I've never felt anything that creepy before, like to the core. We were both shaken by it. I still am. My friend wanted to turn around and go back to see what it was. I did not. Fast forward a little bit. We get to the bridge, and of course it's closed, so we end up having to turn around and go back towards Chesapeake, which meant we had to go back through that same stretch of road again. And right as we are getting ready to pass another car, that thing comes out from behind the car and looked like it was floating or gliding across the road. 
and it crouched down almost like it was getting ready to pounce or take off. It was then I could see the top of its head, which was shiny and black. My friend said maybe it was a person on a skateboard because of the way it was gliding or floating in the middle of the road. He then proceeded to say that was some Jeepers Creepers. All I know is this. It was not a seven-feet person dressed in all black at three in the morning. This was not human. It was evil, and I hope I never experience it again. Has anyone else seen this figure? If so, please let me know. I need to discuss what happened. I was hunting solo in a high-pressure RTC unit four years ago. First time elk hunting and first time hunting the West. It was early September and I had been into elk the two days I had been hunting. I was sitting in a clearing around 5 p.m. waiting for it to get closer to dusk and licking my wounds from earlier that day. I had blown an opportunity at a bull earlier cold calling. Grew impatient 20 minutes into the setup and got it to move and sure enough 30 yards away over a knoll was a bull that promptly got out of town. So there I was, sulking in a clearing, and decided to fix myself a snack to cheer myself up. In typical poor early twenties fashion, most of my meals and snacks were ramen noodles cooked in a Ziploc bag. Halfway through boiling water for the ramen, I start hearing cow calls. Great, I thought some hunters came and set up near me, worsening my mood. To my disbelief, Two cows and a calf stepped out of the woods less than 100 yards from me with a wooded draw in between us. I quickly shut off the stove and figured I could head down that draw and come out close enough to get a shot at one of them. I started sneaking down the draw and about halfway there decided to stop and throw a few cow calls their way and see if I could get them to come up to me. The cows came to the wooded edge but wouldn't come up to me and eventually lost interest and began feeding again so I decided I'd press on and see if I could get a shot. As they were just over a knoll about 50 yards away, I started creeping along again when all of a sudden the brush 10 feet in front of me exploded and a huge mountain lion went sprinting past me. I can still vividly picture the muscle definition in the lion's rear quarters and the thickness of its tail as it bounded away from me. I stood there in absolute shock and disbelief of what I had just seen and witnessed for a few minutes. Once I pulled myself together, I proceeded 30 yards and ended up shooting my first elk. Due to work commitments, I had to begin packing right away, so ended up packing her out around midnight, right back through where I had jumped the lion hours before. As that experience didn't hook me for life, I don't know what will. I now carry a pistol with me whenever I'm in the woods. I'm fairly confident that Lion was stalking the young calf and was oblivious to me sneaking along until I began cow calling just feet away from it, and it couldn't see me. But that's just speculation. I remember the day vividly. The rain was pouring down, and I was hunting caribou with my friend in eastern Alaska. We had been on the trail for a few hours when we saw a man riding down the trail on a four-wheeler. He stopped us and asked if we had a satellite phone. He looked panicked and told us that his girlfriend was dead in their tent when he woke up. Without a second thought, we gave him our phone and watched as he frantically dialed for help. We waited with him for a while and then he took off back up the trail towards the campsite. We decided to continue hunting, hoping that help would arrive soon. Later that day... We saw a trooper on a four-wheeler with a side-by-side -side following with the EMS on the side head up the trail. We assumed it was for the man's girlfriend and felt relieved that help had finally arrived. However, as we continued hunting, we kept an eye on the state trooper daily dispatches, but there was no mention of the incident. It was strange, and we couldn't help but wonder what had really happened. Days turned into weeks, and we couldn't shake off the feeling of unease. We decided to talk to a park ranger about the incident, hoping that they would have some information. The park ranger listened intently to our story, and then told us that there had been reports of a dangerous predator in the area. They suspected that it may have been responsible for the man's girlfriend's death, and that the trooper dispatch was kept quiet to avoid causing panic. Hearing this sent chills down our spines. We realized just how lucky we were to have made it out of there unscathed. We thanked the park ranger for the information and promised ourselves that we would never take the dangers of the wilderness for granted again.
I was always fascinated by the stories my son Jack told me about his discovery of Bigfoot Cave. I remember the excitement in his voice as he recounted the tale of how he stumbled upon the cave during his senior year of high school. He and his friends had decided to explore the cave in the spring of 1994, but what they found there was beyond their wildest dreams. As I listened to Jack's story, I couldn't help but feel a sense of unease. The thought of my son encountering some strange creature out there in the woods was terrifying to me. But Jack was always fearless and adventurous, just like his old man. According to Jack, they had arrived at the cave around 4 p.m. and saw a gigantic, long-haired creature standing at the entrance. They were so scared that they quickly left and ran to a landing far above the cave where they heard moaning sounds. A week later, Zane, one of Jack's friends, decided to visit the landing. It was a beautiful day, and he and his wife planned to camp there for the night. But at midnight they were awoken by the eerie sound of moaning, and Zane's wife refused to ever go camping again. As a park ranger I had heard many stories of Bigfoot sightings, but I never really believed in them until now. Jack's account of his encounter had me intrigued, and I decided to investigate further. I wanted to see if there was any evidence to support his claim of a creature living in Bigfoot Cave. I organized a team of experts and headed to the cave with the latest equipment for detecting any signs of life. As we entered the cave, we could feel the eerie presence of something or someone watching us. Suddenly, we heard the same moaning sounds that Zane had reported. We froze in our tracks, unsure of what to do next. But then I remembered my training and reminded myself that I was a park ranger, and it was my duty to investigate further. We pushed forward following the sounds until we came to a small opening in the cave wall. And there, to our surprise, we saw the unmistakable footprints of a large creature with four toes. I knew then that Jack and his friends were telling the truth. There was indeed something living in Bigfoot Cave. I made sure to report my findings to the authorities and to take all necessary precautions to protect the public from any potential danger. As for me, I still think about that moaning sound in the night and what it might mean, but I am grateful for the experience, as it opened my eyes to the mysteries that lie hidden in the forest, waiting to be discovered. The wind whispered through the Yellowstone trees as I led the group of ten adventurous campers deep into the heart of the forest. My name is Sam a seasoned park ranger with years of experience in these wildernesses. Today, our destination was a place infamous for its numerous Sasquatch sightings. As we delved deeper into the forest, the excitement in the air was palpable. The group split into smaller teams to explore different areas, eager to uncover evidence of the elusive creatures. We had radios to maintain contact, ensuring everyone's safety. However, as time passed, strange occurrences began to unfold. Eerie noises echoed through the trees, and the atmosphere grew increasingly tense. We found the strange footprints and broken branches, evidence that we were not alone in these woods. Our joy turned to fear when one of the campers failed to respond to the radio calls. Panic set in as we searched for them, only to discover their mutilated body lying on the forest floor. It was a horrifying sight, the first hint of the danger lurking in these woods. The disappearances continued, one camper after another vanishing without a trace. The remaining group stumbled upon the grisly remains of their friends, their bodies torn apart with brutal force. It was a nightmare come to life, a realization that we were being hunted by a merciless and territorial clan of Bigfoot-like creatures. I gathered the survivors, their faces etched with terror, and relayed the grim truth. We were in the midst of a battle for our lives. We had become intruders in their sacred territory, and they would stop at nothing to protect it. With each passing moment, the sense of urgency intensified. We navigated through the dense forest, desperately trying to outrun our pursuers. The creature's haunting calls echoed all around us, the presence a constant reminder of the danger lurking in the shadows. One by one, my comrades fell, their screams echoing through the trees before abruptly ceasing. Fear and grief gripped my heart, but I knew I had to keep pushing forward. Their sacrifice would not be in vain. 
In a final act of desperation, I lured one of the creatures into a trap. With every ounce of strength and skill, I fought for my life. Adrenaline surged through my veins as I landed a fatal blow, its lifeless body collapsing to the ground. The rest of the clan, witnessing the demise of one of their own, retreated into the depths of the forest, never to be seen again. Silence settled over the forest, broken only by the mournful cries of the wind. As I stood there, gasping for breath, the weight of loss settled upon my shoulders. The creature I had slain was responsible for the deaths of ten campers, precious lives snuffed out by a merciless predator. I vowed to carry their memory with me, forever haunted by the tragic outcome of our expedition. In the aftermath I emerged as the sole survivor, forever marked by the horrors I had witnessed. The forest, once filled with wonder and mystery, now held a darker truth. The legend of the Sasquatch had turned into a nightmare, a chilling reminder of the perils that lay hidden within the wilderness. With a heavy heart I returned to civilization, burdened by the knowledge of the price we had paid. The memory of that fateful journey would forever serve as a cautionary tale, a reminder to tread carefully in the realm of the unknown. And as a seasoned park ranger, I would forever carry the weight of the lives lost, a guardian haunted by the memory of a battle against unimaginable creatures. Not really a hike, but a walk saw there was this abandoned house that the homeless children would stay in, and people left heaps of expired food on the doorstep for the kids. Holy as it stank! Saw something stuffed in the crawl space venting on the side of the house and checked it out. I realized it was the top of a black man's head. I was terrified and turned around and walked away as fast as possible. This was one of the worst parts of town, so I didn't do anything, but I still think about it. About eight years ago, I went on a hike with my sister. We smoked a blunt swisher sweet split and emptied, then filled with weed in the car beforehand and were very baked as we started the hike. About twenty minutes into the hike, we see what looks like a patch of hair sticking out of the ground. I make a joke about it, and she starts to get really freaked out. I look closer, and sure enough, it looks exactly like human hair. We sat there for a good ten minutes contemplating what to do, even considered calling the cops. Finally got tired of the eerie dread and pulled at the hair. Turns out there's patches of grass that look just like human hair. My eldest cousin was hiking the backwoods of Alabama with his wife. About halfway through their day, he noticed that someone was shadowing them. He calmly informed his wife, who was an Air Force captain at the time, and the both of them casually stretched so that their concealed firearms could be seen by the person shadowing them. That person stopped following them pretty much immediately from that moment. Different story. Younger brother of that cousin was out on a hike somewhere out by Mammoth in California and ran into what looked like a S assault in progress. Like any sensible person, he jumped in to prevent what it obviously looked like. After a short scuffle, he got the guy into a headlock, but the woman started shouting at my cousin that it was consensual. After a brief and... What I brief and what I imagine was a very awkward conversation. This cousin is very religious. My cousin let the guy go and apologized. Luckily for him, the couple was very understanding, and Thry actually praised him for stepping in like he did. There's a park ranger named Jack. My days were usually spent exploring the rugged beauty of the Grand Canyon National Park. However, the tranquility was shattered when reports of strange occurrences reached my ears. Campers spoke of hearing unsettling whispers and witnessing unexplained phenomena deep within the forest. Intrigued and concerned, I couldn't ignore their claims. The campers' accounts led me down a path I never expected. Reddit threads revealed stories of a cryptid known as the Whisperer, a shadowy figure rumored to entice unsuspecting victims into the woods with its hypnotic whispers. I couldn't dismiss these stories as mere fabrications, especially as more reports flooded in. Determined to uncover the truth, I delved deeper into the forest, my senses alert to 
any unusual signs or sounds. The forest seemed alive, whispering secrets that danced on the edge of my perception. Each step brought a mix of anticipation and trepidation. During one of my patrols, the atmosphere crackled with an undeniable energy. The air grew heavy and the chill snaked down my spine. I cautiously moved forward, following a faint trail that led deeper into the heart of the forest. And then I saw it. A flicker of movement in the shadows caught my attention. My heart skipped a beat as my eyes focused on a creature, a cryptid standing just beyond my reach. Time seemed to stand still as I registered its presence. Without thinking, I reached for my rifle, a reflex born out of self-preservation and the instinct to protect. The weight of the weapon in my hands gave me a false sense of control. I took aim, my finger tightening on the trigger. But before I could fire, the cryptid vanished into thin air. It dissolved into the darkness, leaving only the echo of its eerie whispers behind. My shot missed its mark, and the creature was gone, as elusive as ever. A mixture of frustration and awe washed over me. The encounter left me shaken. My belief system shattered. I could no longer deny the existence of the Whisperer. The campers' accounts, the Reddit stories, and now my own first-hand experience had transformed me into a believer. From that moment forward, my dedication to protecting the park took on a new fervor. I no longer questioned the supernatural elements that intertwined with the natural beauty of the Grand Canyon. Instead, I embraced the responsibility of safeguarding both visitors and the enigmatic secrets hidden within the forest. I have worked many different jobs in my lifetime, starting as a janitor. I worked on a farm for about two years at one point later as a P teacher in a high school. I was even an officer before eventually moving to New Jersey, and eventually getting a job as a park ranger in the Pine Barrens. I'd moved to New Jersey to be closer to my family. The job didn't seem to be hard. I'd work four days a week, and I would spend all my time in the park. The other three would be my days off. Now I haven't worked for the park for a very long time, and I'm about to tell you why. I think I lasted a year, and maybe even less than that. I had a series of very strange things happen to me there, and the final straw made me quit my job as soon as I got the chance. So, I began working at Pine Barrens in April of that year. I was introduced to the job in the park by the park services. The place is humongous. It stretches over the area that is twenty, two percent of New Jersey. My job was to patrol a certain area, make sure everything was in order. If you've ever visited the Pine Barrens, you would know that abandoned buildings and towns are scattered throughout the park. I would clock in on a Tuesday, work through the Friday and Saturday through Monday. The first couple of weeks went smooth. I was getting familiar with the woods and my route. The third week was when my first spooky experience happened. It was Thursday evening. I was going my regular route. The park was buzzing with nature sounds. There were no people anywhere that I'd run into that day. I know that sometimes kids like to wander the park at night looking for ghosts or just a secluded place to hang, but I had not seen any of them either. I was taking little mental notes of my surroundings, and I noticed the humming and buzzing. I couldn't tell where it was coming from. At first, I looked around for a few minutes and still nothing. The noise was beginning to get closer, which is when I realized it was sneering me from above. I looked up and saw three bright lights moving in a circle, almost as if they were spiraling down towards me. Instinctively, I ducked and ran as fast as I could. It probably ran for a couple hundred feet before turning around to see the lights were still there. They were not. There was no humming now, either. I dropped to the ground, trying to gather my composite and catch my breath. I also tried to make sense of what had happened five minutes prior. I do believe in aliens, even though I never had an encounter before. I had no clue what else that could have been, so I kind of been in agreement with myself. Those were aliens, and I'd, I wouldn't think about that anymore. And it was okay for a while. My second experience happened about five months after I began working in the park. I was again going on my regular route. It was now about 7 p.m., 
And at this point, since it was October, the sun was getting very low in the sky, and it was getting dark. The route was clear. Everything seemed to be in order until I noticed something lurking behind the trees about a hundred yards away from me. At first it looked like a person, and maybe a man about five seven. I thought it might have been some college kid playing a prank, trying to scare me. I saw his shoulder peeking behind a tree. I yelled out that nobody is allowed to be in the woods the slade in this time of year. He didn't move. Only after I shouted the third time, he had finally moved in front of the tree. I could take a good look at him. When I saw him, I nearly had a heart attack. He was dressed in dirty, torn-up clothing, but the most disturbing thing about him was his head, or lack of one, I should say. I looked at him, not knowing if I should ask what he was, what happened to him, or just bolt out of there as fast as I could. I did neither for a solid three minutes. I froze, even though I noticed he had begun moving closer to me. He started running up to me as he was getting closer. I realized he was also translucent. This was a poltergeist. Now, when it comes to an alien, I'm a believer. When it comes to ghosts, however, I was very skeptical and sarcastic at times that when anybody would talk about ghosts or demons or any alleged paranormal activity, I moved to the right a couple of steps as he was running straight at me, and he just vanished. I turned around to see where he had gone, but there was no trace of him, only a vapory trail of mist, just what looked like a cloud of dust, almost settling. After that second incident, I had decided that all my love for nature and the outdoors, and as much as I loved being a ranger, staying here was not worth it. This hot mess of a place was not worth me going, literally insane for. Trying to keep working there, I called in the next day and explained the situation. They told me that something like this had already happened for their previous rangers. They tried to convince me to stay on the job for longer and doubled my pay, but I refused. I would not risk losing my own mind. Hiking with my scout group a few years back, we usually just followed the roads, but one of our leaders knew the area and told us about a three-kilometer little trail that would lead us straight through the woods and cut about two hours from our planned route, giving us more time to chill in the evening. So we took the trail, and after about a kilometer, came across a campsite. Nothing unusual, just a regular tent. Small campfire set up, but not yet lit, and a few dishes. Then we heard some noise, like someone trying to scream. So we investigated and found a little girl, about six, tied up and muffled in the back of the tent. We asked her who she was and how she ended up tied and muffled on that little trail, but she only spoke Dutch, so I had to translate for the rest of the group. She said her uncle had taken her out to go camping for a few days, and that once they'd arrived here, he'd told her not to leave and tied her up to make sure she wouldn't. We assumed he was a, quote, kid lover and going to awe her or else straight up kill her, so we took her back to the main road called the police, and when they arrived and took care of the girl, a few of the officers asked us to lead them to the camp. When we got back there, the tent was gone, and the fire was broken up to make it seem like there had been nothing there. But you could tell there had been a campsite, and we saw footprints all over. So we assumed that the uncle of the little girl had either seen us talk to the girl and take her away, or else came back from wherever he was to find the girl gone, and assumed he was found out and packed up the tent quickly and noped out of there. I shudder to think what would have happened to the little girl if we hadn't heard her or found her. Edit to clarify. We were eight guys between 12 and 16. Some of us were actual bodybuilders or as close as and tall aft. I assume he thought if we'd seen him, we'd beat him up, which we absolutely would have. We were also thought some very basic but effective self-defense by the scout leaders, in case of any problems, and were told to carry our camping knives in full view to deter problem seekers. Thanks for listening, fellow cowboys. If you like what your old Montana does, do hit that like button and subscribe. I upload brand new episodes every day. Thank you, and see you tomorrow at the same time. God bless.